Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Thusly do the ancient writers concur. Oceans will rise, empires will fall, and the only constant is change. That's a quote from the Remorian book, and Fontaine is finished. So, welcome to another video of a guy stuck in an underwater jail cell. This video is gonna go over the concept of justice in Fontaine through the 4.0 story quest, some prominent characters related to justice itself, as well as other notable details within Fontaine's justice facade as a whole. As always, timestamps in the description. Now, on with the video. Starting with the least helpless Archon in Tevat, Farina is the very embodiment of the concept of justice. Not really. She's Fontaine's god of justice and everyone's favorite mascot. Despite her trying her hardest to represent her very burdening position, bless her soul, she actually knows half of what she's doing. For someone who is dubbed as the god of justice, she herself knows even less than the Udex Nouvellet, often using her, dare I say, cunning bravado and creating drama to stir a trial or save face to avoid embarrassment. But she takes her position pretty seriously, even more considering that there's a prophecy or a judgment looming over Fontaine. Nouvellet mentions that she's been busy collecting information and intelligence to stop this prophecy, but this prophecy is no mere legend that commoners tell their children. It's quite possibly a problem that Farina needs to solve, and a crucial puzzle piece left by the previous Hydro Archon, similar to what Rukadevata left for Nahida. Two out of four parts of this prophecy have already been true, and not taking any action now would let Fontaine drown altogether. Farina must decipher the meaning behind the prophecy, as well as the problem with Fontaine's concept of justice, to not only save her people, but even herself from the painful loneliness that it will ensue. So we've yet to see her doing her job as the Archon, and see her usual self outside of her duties. Egeria is an interesting character, not only because she is implied to be the previous Hydro Archon, but because she ruled in a time where numerous Oceanids dwelled in Tevat, an era where Lockfolk and humans lived together and were connected through clear springs and rivers. Egeria's era likely started after the Archon Wars, but where Fontaine is built is also where a long-sunken musical civilization once was, Remuria whose great empire sank to the abyss thousands of years ago. We'll talk about that more in depth in a different video. But we can still see remnants of the past kingdom, and some are still used to this day, like the Meropis or Meropide, and maybe the Remorian Tower. 500 years ago, when the Cataclysm occurred, the previous Hydro Archon who fought the abyss fell and became a pool of water, the Amrita. This pool of water could purify even the corruption of the abyss. Egeria's name is taken from the water nymph Egeria, who in Genshin is likely an oceanid. Even more interesting is the fountain of Lucine, or in our case, Lucina, Roman goddess of childbirth. Lucina is synonymous with an epithet of the Roman goddess Diana, as well as the water nymph Egeria, all of which have relations with the symbolism of childbirth. And the fountain of Lucine is where couples pray for their children. Now here's where I insert some random notion about the three moon sisters. Diana created a triad with Egeria, the water nymph, and Verbius, the woodland god, synonymous with the sun god Helios. And the solar chariot that the three moon sisters were on is a by name for the sun in ancient Tevat history. So here's the crack theory. Egeria is a moon sister, possibly the sister Arya. And the other two that represent Diana and Lucina, I can't say for sure. But we could say that the fountain of Lucine is also the fountain of Egeria. All the more since the fountain of Lucine is where Fontaine's waters converge, and that it is located in the Erinese district. Erinese represents three goddesses of vengeance to all who do any wrong. And finally, the opera Epicles, which is an opera house that invokes the assistance of gods. Opera Epiclesis. Now that leaves us with this voice line. So interminable. So lonely. Just how much longer? So who or what is this voice? Well, the easiest would be to say that it's Forina. But what if, similar to Ruka Devata, it's the previous Hydro Archon, Egeria? 
Sumeru's Ruka Devata and Kusanali had two voice actors, while Fontaine's Farina and Egeria also have separate voices. If the Fountain of Lucian can hold waters and tears that have emotions, it wouldn't be weird to think that it has the tears that not only Farina, but also tears that Egeria might have shed. Being endlessly alone in an emptiness of water would fit Egeria's situation considering what happened in the Cataclysm and what the Oceanids did after seeing the Amrita. But she technically died in Sumeru. So maybe she left a message there for Farina, just like the consciousness of Ruka Devada in the Urminso. Farina being the person crying would likely point to the rising sea level and the prophecy of Fontaine, of which is already a puzzle that she has to solve, but I can't think of a reason for her to feel something endless or to be lonely. The only correlation I could make is Princess Lyris's frozen time and her solitude, but that is likely a metaphor of Mary Ann and the Narcis and Cruz, which is a different but pretty related questline, and we've yet to find the result of Anne the Oceanid in 4.1, as well as the actual identity of Princess Lyris. But the name Lyris is rooted in the string instrument, the lyre, or in Genshin's case, a harp. Symbolic of Venti's allegorical tales and favorite instrument, as well as Remoria or Remus' symphony of strings. There's also the mention of frozen time along Remoria's fall. Safe to say Lyris is an important name to remember later, be it Egeria, Farina, or a figure from Remoria. Nouvellet is not only the Udex, but is theorized to be a bishop. With his eyes and overall design, and now paired with his somewhat inept understanding of humanity's concepts and logic. Now he's even more baffled by humanity and injustice. His duty as the Udex is to uphold order within Fontaine and ensure that its laws are followed to the letter. And as the Udex, oftentimes he is insulated or numbed from the many importances outside of the courtroom. So upon seeing Callus, Navia, and even Vache, he started to doubt what justice really is, and what it means to not only Fontanians, but humanity as a whole. Remember, is justice a key component to saving Fontaine? He's even more confused about humans' concept of life and its importance. Seeing it happen twice, humans rebelling against their own survival instinct or to consider some things more important than their life. Callas and Navia risk their lives for the sake of justice, and the same can be said for Vache's own justice to himself and Vignet. In the words of Nouvellet, a justice that's higher than life itself. Can it really be called justice if one innocent calls himself guilty to save the many? Or is it justice to fight until death only to prove one's innocence? You know what else is justice? Hitting the like button, subscribing if you haven't yet, and hitting the bell to stay updated to my channel. Thank you. Now, why don't we talk about another factor in Fontaine's justice? Now that we've met with almost everyone in Fontaine, we now have a better grasp of their concept of justice. Specifically speaking, the Oratrice, Mechanique, the Annalise, Cardinal. Even the Udex, Nouvellet, and the God of Justice, Farina, can't deny the verdict that the Oratrice states, meaning that they have little knowledge of its workings and that the Oratrice is the real law of Fontaine, not them. We know that this Oratrice was created by the Hydro Archon, but specifically which Hydro Archon? I mean, would you think that it was Farina who built it, or that the previous Hydro Archon created this long ago and left it with Farina? She has no clue about the Oratrice's declaration of child, even though the guilty party was revealed with Vache's confession. Nouvellet says that he will personally look into the Oratrice and help correct child's verdict if he is in fact innocent. So here's to seeing child Nouvellet and Risley eating donuts at the Meripide in 4.1, as well as seeing our number one mascot trying her damn hardest again. Moving on, we have the voice in the vent near the Oratrice, of which was heard by Linny in his previous magic show. The Oratrice is capable of delivering accurate sentences and has its own consciousness. This is how it was able to declare verdicts. But we still have yet to find out how it exactly converts Fontaine's belief of justice into energy and creates such accurate statements. Luckily, our magician friends Linny and Lynette not only created that basement for the magic trick, but also to access the Oratrice's main core. The Among Us vent that Linny squeezed into led him to the machine's core. But a weird voice that recognized Linny from the Oratrice's core discouraged him from investigating further. As to why Linny and Lynette haven't had another trial for snooping around with something that the Hydro Archon herself created, we've yet to find out. But the voice that was familiar with Linny somewhere in the Oratrice core room, I can only surmise two people. 
the oratress itself speaking, or someone Linny and Lynette knew. Now, I'm not saying that they lied to us again, but implying that he heard a voice that recognized him is arguably a better cover-up than saying that he heard, let's say, Arlecchino or another Fatus, lest they end up with another trial and not only be found guilty, but also lose face with their father, as well as the knave herself being accused. Or heck, maybe it's a family member like their parents' voice heard through the oratress, similar to the Fountain of Lucene. An anonymous voice is better than a known voice when faced with a trial that isn't related to their actual accusation. And learning to separate attention from the focus is one of their skills as magicians and members of the House of Hearth. Even Arlecchino wants to use the Gnosis to first and foremost save Fontaine before giving it to the Saritsa, even though she basically murdered the previous knave. So they have enough right as Fatus and as Fontanians to hide this knowledge. The primordial sea, used to birth all life, also destroys life, and is the recurring end of what seemed like prosperous nations. You can think of it as an end of the world event. The so-called First Era, whose envoys of the heavenly city walked the earth and days of humans were heaven blessed and peace was abundant. Up until the offspring of people would grow tired and rebellious, breaking from their fate as humans blessed by the divines, a flood was sent to the land as punishment for their behavior. Around the time of the rise and fall of Gurabad in Sumeru, I can't really say how long ago that was, the region of Fontaine that was, for a lack of a better term, scattered around, had a new god king that descended. King Remus and his golden rule of Remoria. His kingdom prospered for a time up until he shared his divine powers with four humans. Four shades, maybe? But this is the mistake or sin that Remus made. Humans are easily swayed by their ambition. This started with the abuse of Remorian musicians, followed by Celia or Scylla, the sea dragon king, finally the ultimate end of the Harmosts or Remus's top dogs, betrayal, and the sinking of Remoria beneath the waves. Twice, Fontaine has sunk. The next kingdom that rose was a kingdom of Oceanids and humans, the era of Egeria who settled all conflicts of the past and connected the world like a river. Law and order became the cornerstone of Egeria's rule, and she maintained it till her last breath. Literally, this kingdom prospered for a time until the Cataclysm and Egeria's fall. But no flood has happened, at least not yet. And that is for Farina and the current Fontaine to solve. But she exiled the Oceanids, and who knows how law and justice became so twisted with entertainment today. So Farina's puzzle now is to understand the meaning of justice and to at least continue most of Egeria's desired future to avoid this flood prophecy. Just as the ancient writers concur, oceans will rise, empires will fall, and the only constant is change. Something else related to Fontaine's justice, specifically the trials, is the recurring rain phenomena on every trial. What Leibn says is not the smoke that's covering Fontaine, but the rain clouds above. I'd hazard a guess that the antsy and oppressiveness of the people is more due to the Diluvian prophecy of Fontaine. Another thing is the legend about the dragon of water. Whenever it rains, the dragon of water weeps. Sadly, no one knows where this hydro dragon went or if it's still in Fontaine. Similarly, what happened to a pep might have happened to the hydro dragon as well. The abyss would most likely affect the hydro dragon the most too. Why? Well, the shortest answer I could give is that Fontaine used to have a city that sank all the way down to the abyss, and the great dragon of the deep once bowed to the god king of Remoria. This dragon might have been Scylla, the king of the seaborn dragons, who was defeated and his power was sealed. This dragon king of water might be the most affected by the abyss compared to the other dragons that we know. We also have knowledge of Enkanomiya's new dragon of water evolving to become pure Hydro Vishap human. So we might have two dragons of water somewhere in Fontaine. The first dragon of water which is likely hiding somewhere underneath the surface and is also where we might find more remnants of Remoria. Second is the new dragon of water that evolved into a pure Hydro elemental being. 
Finally, the Melusine are quite the curious race within Fontaine. Born from what seems to be a sea monster, Elinas, Elinas, the Melusine are a race that are welcomed in Fontaine and have not only a keen sense of sight but also a deep sense of justice. Their keen sight allows them to see what most normal beings and even vision holders couldn't. Similar to Aranara, these Melusine can see a sort of true form of whatever the creature or being they're looking at is. Some Melusine could paint wonderful paintings paintings that are only original to them, yet their paintings aren't what you would normally perceive. While some individuals, if given a true sight potion, can see what can only be described as ghosts of the past. These Melusine, once born from their mother slash father, Elinas, are given a component that is specific to them. These components come from a variation of forms that are for some reason related to something of importance. A component that can access an instrument from the Remorian era, or a component that can help repair a specific Narcissan Cruz Ordo Mecha. And that's beside the fact that some of these Melusine are members of the Marachuse Phantom, a force that is directly commanded by the Udex Nouvellet. Yet we still have no idea why these Melusine have a very deep sense of justice. We know that they are thankful to Nouvellet, but we also know that these come from a dragon that almost destroyed Fontaine. Maybe some of these components will be a crucial piece for Fontaine's justice and to help solve their flood problem. Who knows what special items these components will be used for in the future. And there we go, a sort of overview of lore regarding everything that I could find about Fontaine's concepts of justice. And I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Comment below what do you think is going to happen next. We've yet to see even more prominent characters in the next patch, so hold on to your seats until we find the secret of the Oratress, Farina and Aguirre's puzzle, and Nouvellet's problematic stance on justice. We've got more topics to talk about like the Narcissus and Cruz and Remoria lore, as well as more specific character lures which we'll go over in due time so for now i'll see you guys in the next video yeah like on if you enjoyed subscribe and hit the bell for more of my ramblings and stay mad theorists bye